folks, I feel like this is a true kind of surprise because uh, Katie conducted this interview with her mother, who many of you know and appreciate and admire, as we do. Uh, and this actually wasn't intended necessarily to be for our greater podcast audience, um, but it's just so good. It's so rich. And so we are excited, as Katie will tell you here in a bit, to share share this portion of it um, with you here on the podcast. Yeah, so it was just too good not to share with some of you guys. I know that not all of our listeners are in the Get It All Done Club. So hundreds of questions were asked in the Get It All Done Club to my mother to get a older woman's perspective on marriage and family and discipline and all of those things. And I like to keep a lot of my mom's input and wisdom not just completely public because I just feel like it's easier to be open and straightforward and vulnerable in those environments. And so this is a almost three hour long interview that we did. And the whole thing is getting released in the clubhouse. Um, so if you are in the clubhouse, then you could just feel free to enjoy it in there. But this part we cut out and decided to give to you guys, as well as I decided to also create a private podcast that is a four episode private podcast where I broke down a large portion of this interview for you guys to listen to in a space that is not on YouTube and not on Apple Podcasts at large. So if you would like to get that private four little mini series of the rest of this interview, then you can head over to the link down in the description box and I will send that to you as well. It doesn't have every single detail that is shared in the clubhouse, but it's a lot more than what we shared in today's episode. And I just hope that you guys find it encouraging. But now that we're a family podcast. So for those of you, this is kind of a little bit of a different way of doing a Q&A. Usually mommy and I are in the same room and we get to speak to the camera together. But in this instance, we just decided it's been too long since we've been able to get together and record. And we had lots and lots and lots of questions in the clubhouse. I think I posted, I'm going to do a Q&A with my mom. And we had 135 questions few hours later. And so we're going to go through some of those today. And um, yeah, but Mama, for those who don't know you, can you just tell me a little bit about what life looks like for you right now? Maybe people have heard your past Q&As, but maybe they haven't, you know, so just introduce yourself a little bit. Sure. I'm Janice. I am 57. I'm the mother of 11 children and 10 beautiful grandchildren, five of which are Katie's. And um, we live here in Bend, Oregon. Uh, We sold our house in Boise because my mother-in-law passed away. And we came back to Bend to just help support um, my father-in-law. And so we've got seven uh, kids at the house living here. We've got three adults. And I'm still homeschooling four of the youngers. And um, just life is full uh, with just community and family and travel and just life is fantastic. So um, anyway, it's just a joy to be here. Yeah, you have quite the spread. And that's honestly something that's made me the most intimidated probably about having the large family has been the last few years. As I've seen you navigate, you know, me and Kyla and Caroline and Baylor all married and having grandkids now, and then you still homeschooling and having single adult children, dating children, like kids launching in different directions, boys and girls. And it's just like, wow. And then on top of that, you have parents, you know, passing and navigating that. And it's just, you're spread very thin potential or very wide relationally. And yet I think you do a really, really good job of that. Um, anyways, and I just, it's a testament to God's faithfulness and also how you continue to grow in every season. And that's something I really admire about you. Yeah, I was talking to Kyla the other day. I have Kyla and Adam, our second daughter, and her three grandbabies out here from Kentucky. And we also had my mother, who is 93, turning 94 in August. And um, wow, just a full house. You know, a sister over, spent the night with her husband. And it's been really fun. But um, I told her, I said, I feel like I'm getting a PhD. Like you think you never arrive. And that's what's so awesome about um, you know, building a family legacy is that you continue to grow, you t- continue to develop, you continue to um, have more bandwidth and just, you know, you start to cut and slice all the things that are extra 
And you have to really focus on the things and be super intentional on the things that are important to you that you really want to invest in. And so, you know, the Lord has my attention and uh, I'm on my knees and I'm growing just like you, just like I had to grow through Katie. I had never had a baby before and I had to grow through that whole experience to five kids, to 11 kids, to grandkids. Uh, you're always growing and developing and reading and um, it's fantastic. It keeps you engaged in life. And yeah, I just, I, you see that in your marriage and I see that in your parenting and that's something that's really encouraging to me. And I hope that it's encouraging to the gals too in the clubhouse that like, it's not like everything that you're working to grow and learn at now, it's you don't just want to survive this season because then another season comes and then another season comes and then, and then you're in debt. And so it's always worth working, working, working because it's going to pay off because you never, someone that never stops growing is going to do better in every season. It's not like the seasons just stop being difficult. They just change and you can get better. Like I've seen you, like you get better. Um, but that's why we need to continue growing because it's never like, oh, well, you just like make it through till your kids are in school or something, or you make it through till they're out of the house or whatever. Like those are real myths that people try to populate. Yeah, some people try to say, oh, I can't wait till they're 18 and I'm out of the house and I have empty nest. You know, I'm like, whoa, like you're, you never stop being a mom. You know, I mean, I want to love my sons-in-law now. I want to, you know, it just keeps, if you're staying in the game, um, the way I believe that God created it to be, um, then you're going to, you never arrive and can sit on your hinds and, you know. <laughs> yeah, but it's a very fulfilling, rich life is what, is what I've seen and what I've experienced. Yes. All right. Okay, so diving into these questions, um, you pick some of the ones that you that showed up most often and that you wanted to answer. And so we're going to go through some of these today. How do you get out of a rut? So this is a question that's pretty consistently asked in the clubhouse. And I think because a lot of us find ourselves in ruts, like it's, it's easy to get into them. Yeah. Katie, can I preface before we get into that question? Absolutely. I just wanted to, first of all, um, Thank you for having me on here. And I just really see this as such a blessing and such a calling on your life. You and Elisha, actually, now that we're a family, is ministering to thousands of families across the world, actually. And um, I run into people everywhere I go. No matter what state I'm in, I find somebody who's on, who knows you guys and somehow connects the dots. And it's just amazing. So, um, uh, I wanted to say that I read through the questions that you guys put, and it was really fun for me to see because I could see the mindsets and the maturity of you guys. I felt like, oh my goodness, like this culture has some somewhat of the same culture that we have in our own family. Like I was talking to my own daughters. And so it was just super fun to see me, you guys um, developing your mindsets, developing maturity and um, doing hard things and um I just want to make sure that you don't get uh, discouraged, okay? Because it's really easy to um, think of, you know, you you can set the bar up here and say, oh, I want this, I want this, you know, and um, I bet I'm only here right now. And it's always important to look backwards and always count the wins because you're always winning or growing, okay? You guys are never failing and you want to stay out of the gap and you want to stay out of um, discouragement. Um, you know, Galatians 6, 9, I just want to encourage you with these words. And let not, and let, let's see, and let us not be weary and well-doing for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And you as mothers every day are sowing seeds into your marriage, into your children, and it, everything you do matters. You're, you're, you're either sowing seeds of, um, you know, discontent and, you know, harsh words. And, you know, we can, we can sow bad seeds just as well as good seeds. And so I just want to encourage you in the, the role that you're in to, um, you know, don't get discouraged and don't compare, just own your life, you know? So anyway, how do you get out of the ruts? Okay. The way you guys, we all get in them. First of all, um, I, I can get in runs. We all do. It's just human nature, but you've got to stop and think about it and ask yourself questions. And so, you know, I like to just go through my um, 
giant five, as my husband would say, you know, where I, where am I in my relationship with the Lord? Have other things become the priority, um, have become more important to him, them, to um, more important um, than him. You know, where is my marriage? Is it thriving? How are my kids doing? Um, and maybe you could ask yourself, you know, if I could make one change, what would it be? Sometimes when you look at your whole life, you just go, oh, you could feel overwhelmed at everything, but just take one thing, always simplify it down, make it simple for yourself. And, you know, health is always a good place to start. Um, you know, I, I've shared before having one suite a week, you know, or, Hey, I need to start exercising. Exercise is so important for you guys. I always shoot for five days a week and sometimes I only get four. But energy begets energy. And um, so maybe you're just, uh, maybe you're exercising already. And you feel like you're in a rut for exercise. You just be like, think about it and say, oh, maybe I need to do a like triathlon or train for a 5K race. I did that with Katie. I did it with my kids. We did a mini triathlon and we all trained. And this is when I had littles. Katie, how old were you? When we did the triathlon, I, I have no idea how old I was at that stage. Maybe like, was that in Maple? I was like nine or 10. That was Doofer. Remember oh. that little we did when Doofer? Oh, that's right. I, okay. At this stage, I was like 18. So we were 18, 17, 16. And then yeah. you had all the way down to babies. Yeah. Oh, and then guys, I remember, do you remember that mama? When you came out, we were going to swim in our pond. We were going to practice okay. swimming laps. You should not say that right now. <laughs> <laughs> I feel bad because like we thought mama was like bulletproof, but I think we actually made her feel bad. <laughs> but mommy came out in a one piece swimsuit with biker shorts, like under the swimsuit. And it was so eighties, but like in a, like, like the eighties clothes were made for that look and the biker shorts and the swimsuits now are not. And anyways, we were all just like mortified and we made mommy feel so bad. <laughs> Oh my goodness, that is so funny. Oh, you guys. Okay, so yeah, we trained for a little mini triathlon, which was totally outside my, you know, comfort zone. I remember I could not, I was going to drown. My um, uh, freestyle stroke was not good. I ended up like doing the breath stroke for the swim part, you know, but we all trained together and it was fun, but it mixed it up, you know? And so, um, you know, I know Katie trained for a 10 mile and I said, hey, I'm going to do that with her. And when you were, how old were you, Katie? 10 years I was, old? I was 11 when I did my first half marathon. I think that was, oh, yeah. 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 Okay. So uh, anyway, mix it up. Um, you can mix it up in your cooking. Get a new recipe. That's so easy to do nowadays. Um, and Katie has a great resource for that for fun foods. But um, um, challenge yourself to only cook fresh for a whole week. Okay. That's kind of a challenge. Um eliminating your technology and just see what happens to your life that could be mixing it up very much because all of a sudden you are going to find that you've got a lot more time and what am I going to do with my time remember that boredom is a good thing boredom makes you be creative so um maybe you need to have hospitality have a family over and serve maybe you want to um do a creative centerpiece for your table for the family. Maybe you want to throw a tea party for your little girls. And, you know, um, you go to the library, get a book on tea parties, you know, create homemade things. Like it can be very fun. Um, maybe a good book um, would interest you. And uh, whenever I read a book, I always, I know Katie has talked about this too, is what is the action that I'm going to take away from that? Because it's so easy to listen to podcasts. There's so much information out there. And we can just get inundated with information. You can go to a homeschool conference and hear everything. And if you don't sit down and process and say, okay, what am I taking away from this? What am I going to do to become a better person um, or to develop myself? It is all for naught. It's just a bunch of information. So, um, you know, read a book, plant a garden. If you don't have have a big yard you can just get little boxes and say hey, i'm going to grow herbs and i'm going to cook with fresh herbs you know whatever um i remember the other day i was just driving down here in bend and my kids were at sewing lessons and i had about an hour and a half and i was like 
that I saw Pilot Butte over there. I was like, I could just pull over right now and just like run up that hill, you know? And so I was like, get some fresh air, just like very spontaneous. But you guys being spontaneous is, it creates fun. Like, oh, wow, I'm kind of out of my normal sink. I'm doing something kind of different and fun. And it makes you feel alive inside. Um, maybe doing a picnic dinner for your family out of the park, just surprise and say, we're all going to, you know, the park, we're gonna have a picnic dinner and uh, bring a Frisbee, bring some games for the kids and um, create your own fun little family. Um, another easy way to do it is to go to your dream board. Hopefully you guys have done a dream board. I didn't have a chance to do the pictures because I couldn't fit it, figure out the technology, but I did write down what I wanted this year. But um, sometimes going to your dream board and just remembering what you wanted back in January. What was it that I really wanted? Oh yeah, I forgot about that. I kind of got in the rut, right? Um, or look at your list of the hundred things that you want to be do and have that could spawn you on. Um, surprise your husband and ask him on a date. And um, use your five senses, okay? Um, what is something that he loves to smell? What is something that he loves to touch? What is something that he loves to taste, hear, and see, okay? So, you know, he might like the smell of a fire. Or I have a little bottle of, it's just a little bottle of perfume that I only bring out at very special occasions because um, we celebrated our 25th in um, Hawaii, and it's like this fantastic perfume that he absolutely loves. But I can't get a hold of it, but as soon as he smells that smell, it's like, ah, you know, but um, that's a fun way to think about it when you're trying to surprise your husband is take the five senses and see what you can do with it. Be creative. Um, maybe um, also, like I said before, evaluate your uh, giant five priorities you know, where do you stand in those? What can you mix it up? Maybe writing a letter of gratitude to somebody for something that they did to you, did for you or blessed you. And um, I know I've received letters from a lot of you guys just thanking you for the Q and A's that Katie and I have done and how it's impacted your life. And I just always am humbled and just, you know, get teary eyed thinking about you guys. Um, but uh, maybe declutter a space in your house and freshen it up. Say, I'm just going to take this little space, fix it up. Maybe do some fresh pillows or uh, plants or flowers. Go to Trader Joe's. They have real reasonable, you know, things on flowers. And Or maybe you get a, um, buy a new tablecloth. I know that recently I went out and bought about five new tablecloths and everybody's been commenting on them. And my daughter Kyla's like, I think I want to go home and get some tablecloths, you know? Uh, I did. I got my tablecloth based off seeing your one that you did for Thanksgiving. I went and got one that was from the same, the same brand. Yeah. Only like $20 for an eight, for an eight foot table, you know, or pretty reasonable. But um, anyway, so those are a few things that I came to mind when I thought about getting out of a rut. Well, this is why I think you're such a breath of fresh air, mommy, is because first of all, it's hailing outside. So I don't know if it's like really loud, but anyways, it is what it is. It's, it's loud in the garage for me. But um, why I think it's so powerful is because everything that you're saying is energy begetting energy. Everything you're saying actually sounds like more work. And when you're in a rut, more work sounds super daunting, like because it, it takes creative energy to like put something together for your husband or your kids or do it buy a tablecloth or something like that. But often taking action is the last thing we feel like doing. And that is what begets the energy. And when we're just sitting around feeling lethargic, what we want someone to say is like, you need to take a bubble bath and, you know, just veg. And then we feel worse about ourselves and the rut gets deeper. We're, when we go out and we do something, that's actually where you get energy back because things start to give you energy in your home. Your children give you energy. Your husband's giving you energy and you just start getting that cycle going. So know that like if you're in a rut and you're feeling very discouraged and bummed out, sometimes the best things you can do are the things that you feel the least like doing. And so I, I love that you shared that. You shared so many practical examples too. So I feel like there's something in there for everybody, for sure. Um, okay, 
<laughs> no, there is. Yeah, going on to homeschooling, what are some tips for homeschooling with all littles? The gal asking this question is a seven-year-old, four-year-old, and two-and-a-half-year-old. And you've definitely been there. I don't know how many times I've heard someone say, oh, I used to take lessons, but I don't play anymore. And we wanted to change that at VoteBergMusicAcademy.com. So the way that Elisha teaches guitar, the way that Kelsey teaches piano, the way that Lilia teaches fiddle is that you can pay for one year of music lessons for your child and they will have a lifelong skill that they will be able to take with them into adulthood. Whether or not they continue lessons or continue daily practice after that. But my bet is that they're gonna fall in love with the style of learning music and creating music, and so they aren't going to want to stop practicing. Something in our home that has blown me away is that the children don't ever have to be told to practice. Anytime I say, hey, would you like to take out your fiddle and play a song? They say, yes, and they run out and they get their fiddle, and a dozen times a day, they will run out and do it on their own. That is so fun for me to not have to nag my kiddos to practice and to see them develop this lifelong skill that brings joy to our family and bring joy and fulfillment to their own life. For a discount code for Voberg Music Academy, you can check out the link in the description box for a special discount for our podcast listeners. What I have found is pulling the family together and teaching all together is really actually a fun thing. Um, when you get assignments, you can always make the assignment more difficult for the older child and very simple for the younger child, you know, but um, teaching everybody together, the kids need to, the younger ones are picking up and listening to everything. You guys, our babies are geniuses. They really are. And we need to see them as, you know, you know, not just putting them off to the side, include the family all together. I know we do. Um, we've really enjoyed mystery of history the past three years. And I've got my, uh, you know, 18 year old that's doing it. And my, you know, it was eight at the time. And <clears throat> we're all hearing history. They're hearing, you know, about geography, how to pronounce things, you know, countries and uh, vocabulary. And <clears throat> but um, so teaching all together is fun. I, the things I like to teach together are um, <clears throat> mystery of history and science and um, the things that are more individualistic are uh, math and spelling. And then of course, doing Bible all together. And then children thrive on routine. If you're reinventing the wheel every single day, it's gonna get exhausting, it's gonna wear you out. For me, it's gonna wear me out emotionally and oh, you know, just changing it. And your kids learn to know what to expect. Oh, we eat at eight o'clock, we start, um, you know, school or, you know, we start out with chores before breakfast, you know, our day started at 730 in the morning, you know, with chores, and then we ate at eight o'clock. And then um, I shot for nine o'clock to start school to have um, scamp finished speedy clean after meal party. If you don't know what that is, I'm sure Katie's got a YouTube on that. But um, and then start out with um, a Bible story, you know, um, sometimes changing up the location makes it different for the kids like okay so we're all cleaned up let's all go into the front room you know i know at school we had little rugs you can get sample rugs everybody sit on their little rug you know and that would be good if you've got multiple kids so they know that this is their space not to get off it or whatever but um sit down talk about uh you know do the a becca bible story um sing together doing bible verses together we're all memorizing the same verse uh, verses so that when we're in taking car trips, wherever we are, we're all quoting. You just pull out your little three by five cards and go through your verses and say them together. But um, outside play is super important. Taking breaks. You never want your kids to go um, to do school to the point where they're just like, exhausted or they feel like they're going to, they're going to cry. It's just too much. You always want them wanting more like, Oh, can't we read one more chapter? Can't we? Nope. You've got to wait till tomorrow. You know, you got to make it exciting for them, but, um, taking frequent breaks. Um, okay. Everybody outside. If I notice that my kids are getting restless, I would be okay. Everybody run around the house three times on your mark. Get set, go, you know, I'm like, ah, they go out and run around and all of a sudden you reset them, you know, and they're ready for the next thing. But sometimes moving from lesson to lesson, it's just too much for the kids. So be in tune to their need for, to wiggle their bodies and to move around, um, during winter, you know, if it was 
you could still do it. My kids still did barefoot in the snow around the house three times. But uh, we lived in a house where I had them run from one to the one side to the other, or okay, we're gonna do five push ups. You know, Mark say go, or mother, may I play a, a cute game that lasts two minutes, you know? Um, but let's see. Yeah, I don't know why I got into this other part, but um, outside play. I guess I wrote down some of the reasons why I thought out, outdoor play was important. You're teaching skills to your kids. Okay, so I invest in a couple of cones and get a ball. And um, the, the skills that I wanted my kids to know about were um, soccer, frisbee, volleyball, tetherball. That's easy to put in. Um, get a plastic bat and ball, knowing how to hit. Um, relay, relay races, trampoline. Um, my goal for my children is for them to be capable kids and capability is what brings confidence to your children. So I want my kids, I, my goal for my children is to raise extraordinary leaders. And that just makes me want to cry to think about that. But that is my mission to grow, you know, extraordinary leaders who impact the world for Christ. You know, and so when you see your kids as you are the coach for these extraordinary children, which I do see them as that, you know, as I look at Katie, that's why I just want to cry right now. Yeah, an extraordinary leader, right? Sitting right in front of me. This is what I was training. And God has chosen you to be the parent of each one of your children. And it's for you to see the good in them, to bring out their strengths, to develop their strengths, for the mission that God has for them. So when your kids feel capable and sorry, I don't know. I'm so emotional. Oh, I'm no. getting older. Okay. You're talking about big uh, stuff. You part, poured your heart and soul into for years and years and years. Yeah. But so anyway, when you get, um, so I wanted my kids to, when they got into a situation to be like, Oh, I know how to do that. Or, you know, I wanted them to be the ones that are teaching the kids that don't know how to do it. Okay, this is the way you hold a bat. And these are the rules to the game. And, and um, you know, I think that was one of the questions in here is how to develop leadership in your children. And um, see yourself as you've got a million dollar racehorse, well, racehorses, you know, and it's, it's our job to, to train them. But um, reading and writing is something that took a little more attention and effort. And so I like to do that when the babies are napping. Um, so, and then piano is definitely individual, but um, having your kids help cook, do lots of reading with them. Science books are fun. And then in the evening, of course, closing off with chores and, um, and at, during the day, just sharing what they learned in the evening meal. I'm sorry share what they learned for the day. It's always good for them to talk back and talk about the things. It's, it, uh, it's good for conversation at the table. And um, gamify as much as you can. People are at their best when they're having fun and make it playful. And it doesn't have, learning is a blast. I mean, I think that's one of the things I wanted my kids to learn. I, I mix up our homeschool program every year because I have so much fun learning. I'm like, oh, we already did that. I did that with those, the olders. Let's do something new. And, and they're picking up on your excitement. Are you a learner? Do you get excited about growing? Because that's going to naturally, um, you know, more is caught than taught. We hear that all the time. But as you lead yourself and as you are excited about your life and who you are and what you're doing, you're going to pass that off to your kids. Yeah. And something that I think you did well as well is I know people probably have a question about math. And I feel like you taught us to be pretty independent with math early on. And I think that served really well because that independent problem solving, you know, you talk about being capable or whatever, but I didn't think I was very good at math my whole life. And now I'm realizing, I think it actually taught me a lot of the problem solving I deal with today because I didn't have like a natural math brain, but I had to figure it out. And I, yeah. I, I fall back on those skills a lot of times when I can't figure something out. And I'm just kind of like, well, I can, I can figure this out. And I think that that was one thing that you just, you kind of were hands off on and you would check our test papers to make sure that we weren't cheating because I went through a little cheating spell. I think it was like eight. <laughs> and 
so you had to start um, checking that out. But then I feel like that's, I don't know, I really respected the way that that worked and we're doing the same thing with our kids. And I think that's something that I've seen that you did with our family, and I see a lot of families not doing this, is encouraging that independent learning spirit early on, because if you have a lot of kids stacked in back to back to back to back, you want a child that can like read to themselves so you aren't training them to read, or you want a child doing their own math so you aren't having to do their own you know math with them. And so kind of launching them pretty quickly, I feel like you did that. And then were, you were going around managing everybody all day long, obviously, and doing one-on-ones and stuff like that. But some educational philosophies that are really popular right now are so slow to get the child to launch. And the parent kind of like orbits around the child like they're the son. And it takes so long. Like you, you got to consider your homeschooling methodology for, for your specific family. And if you have a lot of children and you have to raise all of them to be capable adults, then you might need to do something that's a little faster, even if it's not as ideal uh, or, you know, idealistic is maybe what you want. Um, anyways, that's like a total side thing. With math, I would always sit with them and introduce them new concept. And we would do a few examples. So, okay, you think you've got it. Okay, next. So they go do that. And if they have any questions, instead of interrupting other people, I say, just leave the problem and I will come and talk to you. Because if I, if I had everybody coming to me with all of their questions, the person I was working with would not get my full attention. And so when I was finished with that person, then, Hey, what are your questions? I'll answer those now. Um, but after I did Saxon math up through eighth grade and I changed over to teaching textbooks because, um, problems started getting more difficult and um they have a teacher a tutor on there that if you get it wrong then you they help you through it and my kids all seem to be fine and seem to figure stuff out and i was like great this works awesome so um i know one of the rules that i have is if, if the children miss more than six problems and they have to do the whole lesson over the same day so they are motivated to double correct their work and make sure that it's right. And um, so, and on a test note, they couldn't miss more than four or they have to go back over the whole, start with, you know, that unit again and take the whole unit. So um, there was some motivation there. Yeah, yeah, that's big. Yeah, and then with school, making sure it's done by three, 3.30, we're done. Whatever, and if you didn't finish, um, there were consequences because there was plenty of time during the day to get your stuff done. Um, but that way school isn't running into night and, you know, we have this project and that project and it's like, Hey, there needs to be a cutoff. We need to say, Hey, tomorrow's another day. So. Yeah. Something that Charlotte Mason talks about too, like she's been a, a big help to me in homeschooling is that we teach our children then to it becomes a character habit to dawdle and to procrastinate and to put stuff off and drag their feet. And you don't want like school is forming how they are going to attack problems the rest of their lives. So you really don't want them to get these work habits um, that are going to bite them when they're a parent or when they're a spouse or when they're in a place. So. um, Yes. Katie, uh, to piggyback on that, I remember really encouraging you guys, Hey, get your schoolwork done in the morning before breakfast. You can be done with math. You can be done by noon and really praising the kids that did that. Did you see what she just did? And they start realizing the sense of accomplishment, getting up and getting your, I would talk to them the night before. Hey, you lay out your map, your Bible, you could have this all done by seven three, and then work on your other things and look at all the free time that you have to do X, Y, Z. So, yeah. 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 I loved that. I would, we'd be up at, you know, five 30, six, do our math. I remember getting all our school done and only having to practice the piano after breakfast. And those were such fun days getting to play the whole rest of the day. And I mean, this is when I'm nine and 10. So mama really were mama really built into this, us, this owning your own education and doing that very early. And I think all of us are pretty intrinsically motivated to getting things done. And obviously there are certain subjects that are harder for other kids than others, but um, I would say overall, we're all really motivated to knock stuff out. Um, Okay. How can we help our children to not get carried away by school peers when there is not an option for homeschool? Oh, wow. Let's see here. Um, Question number four. Okay, here we go. Oh, you know what? I jumped three. Let's go into three real quick. Oh, okay. How to avoid total chaos while learning. 
Oh, like I said, mix up the location. Always have the kids uh, wanting more and taking breaks. Um, let's see. Oftentimes when there is, I'm feeling like things are getting out of control or there starts to be bickering or things are just not at rest. I'll say, hey, everybody jump on the couch. We're going to read a story. Reading a story takes your kids out of the situation, puts them in the story and they forget, you know, and it brings automatic peace to the house. Um, another thing to bring calm, I would everybody sit down, say for 15 minutes, I want you to grab a book and just be quiet. And mommy's going to play the harp while you look at your book. And, you know, all of a sudden the harp or, you know, put on quiet music, you know, you don't have to play an instrument. Um, or the other thing is have everybody go outside. We're going to go outside for 20 minutes and then we're going to come back in. We're going to knock it out. So um, also training first time obedience. You know, the other day I was taking Coco, uh, my granddaughter, you know, she wanted to ride in the stroller and she was whining because her brother was in the front and blah, blah, blah immediately Kyla picked up on that. She said, no, you're going to, you walk with me. You know, you don't get what you want, you know, but it, the whole first time obedience was just amazing to see that in action and going, yeah, that's good parenting right there. She like nips it in the bud. So it's not developing into these full blown tantrum, you know, yelling, raising your voice. It's just nip it in the bud the first little infraction and you bring order and you actually bring joy to your children because they, they, they know where the boundaries are. It brings a calm to them that, Hey, somebody's in control and care enough about your children to train them proactively, proactively. Yeah. So, um, anyway, um, also when, uh, they're reading, uh, to make sure that your children are engaged when they're reading, Katie, I know you do this, but have your children say, hey, I'm going to ask you to recite what you just heard. Or I want you, when I was reading the Bible, how many times do you hear this word? And so they're like all counting and they're really listening because they know something is required of them. So um, learning to sit still is the first part of education. Learning to control your body. And so, you know, put school aside. We're going to sit on the couch. I'm going to ask you to do the worst thing in the world. You have to sit there. You're not going to like it. You're going to hate it. It's terrible, but we're going to do it for five minutes, you know, and then extend the time to a little bit, but learning to control yourself. You know, I, I know Katie's worked really hard on this. When we get to talk to our grandkids on, you know, with the over the computer, she's got five kids all huddled around her. And, you know, if things were out of control, they would be grabbing the computer. And I want, I want to talk in this, but they all just like sit there very nicely, take turns as they speak. And, but that comes from training. And, um, so learning to sit still is the first part of education and, um, pray. Oh, and that's it. Yeah. Pray is the next one, but we can always pray for our kids in every situation. <laughs> Absolutely. And I love how you're sharing these things because you're saying, hey, have these high expectations when it's a sitting, quiet learning time, high, have a high expectation of your child, but then don't push them to anger by extending that for hours and hours, have breaks. So kind of have these bursts, but have intentionality with each burst, because I think it's easy to fall on either side of the ditch where it's like, I'm going to expect my seven-year-old boy to sit here, not fidgeting for a six hour school day, which is unhelpful and just you're both going to lose in that situation. Yeah. Or my kids are just going to be up and down and bumping all around and not learning good study habits and learn, learning good self-control and learning to focus and do what they're intended to do. So having intentionality, but also working with the grain of your child is so, so helpful in raising children that, that love to do things and, and want to grow in capability and focus. Mm -hmm. So going into how can we help our children not get carried away by school peers, this is a little vague, um, when there is not an option for homeschool. So what would you say to that? Number one, pray, 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 pray. If that is not an option, sincerely an option, um, then pray and make sure that your family culture is stronger than their peers. And you've got to have a really strong, healthy family culture, um, Find the best school you can, the smaller, the better, and be at, as involved as you can with the classroom. And then um, not only having 
quantity, uh, quality time with your kids, but quantity, like you need to be on top of it because the school systems are just, you know, you, I just don't know how kids, people send their kids to public schools and the things that they're exposed to on kids' phones, what they're teaching in the schools. Um, it's just, um, you know, amazing. So uh, being intentional about having friends over, know who the friends are. And a lot of these conversations, uh, I find that the most important things that come out in my children's mouths is when I'm spending lots of time with them. We're out weeding, okay? Weeding together. And they're just talking. Oh yeah, and I find out all kinds of things about their friends and, you know, but it's not like we're sitting down and we're gonna have a conversation about your friends. It's kind of like, like Deuteronomy 6 goes, as you, you know, walk by, as you lay down, as you get up, you're just like in relationship, in conversation, cooking. Uh, whatever it is, but that's, they're going to start talking about what's really going on and you can be in tune and just praying that the Lord would reveal things that need to be revealed um, that might be wrong, but um, a lot of conversations and you better make sure that you have your children's heart and that's whether you are put them in school or not, but we need our kids' hearts. And I like to talk to my kids about being on the offensive. So I know, you know, Katie, Kyla, Kelsey all played volleyball for a public school and we would talk on our drive to the school. Okay, you guys, this is who you are. And um, I want you to really be reaching out to them. We need to share the love of Christ and, um, you know, at setting them up to be on the offensive um, as well as defensive. So, um, you know, reading stories like Daniel, Daniel 1, 8, he purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. And so I know I talked to my kids a lot about that. And Daniel, he purposed before he even got to Babylon, what he was going to do, regardless of the outcome, you know, whether they chopped up his head or not, they pretty purposed in his heart and the Lord had favor on him and blessed him. And, um, so, uh, yeah, using, um, uh, heroes of the Bible to instill in them and, and, and calling them out. This is who you are. You're a light in the darkness and you're a peculiar person and don't be afraid to be treated different or if people make fun of you, expect it. And if we're fitting in and everything is cool within the culture, everybody loves you. You're probably not so very salty in your relationship with the Lord, because, um, there should be a presence, a fragrance about us that people two seconds in our presence know that something is different about them. So, and then ask lots of questions. Yeah, that's good. Thank you, mama. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. uh, how would you deal with a person repeatedly telling lies? 